Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session today. We're going to get started in just a minute, uh, in about two, a minute or two. So just relax and we'll be with you shortly. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started today. Hi, everyone. Good to see you back for another webinar here with the Nonprofit Finance Fund. For those that may not know me, my name is Michael Ibrahim, Program Manager with the Mass Cultural Council and the Cultural Investment Portfolio. Uh, the Cultural Investment Portfolio is all about grants and services for nonprofit cultural organizations. And with that in mind, we are excited to present the next installment of our financial management webinar series, Understanding the Mission Money Matrix. This workshop is part of our recover, rebuild, and renew efforts to help organizations come back from COVID-19. This spring, we've been offering two workshops every week in the areas of financial management, legal issues, human resources, advocacy, management, and board governance. Joining us today is Alice Antonelli. She's a director from the Nonprofit Finance Fund. We'll get started in just a minute, but a few ground rules as we get going. Number one, feel free to say hi in the chat with the name of your organization. Give a little wave there so, so we can all say hi. Uh, this session has automatic captioning. Auto-generated captions are provided on all Mass Cultural Council meetings and webinars. If you need additional accommodations to ensure your participation for future sessions, just let us know when you register and we'd be happy to do that. We will have time for questions throughout this presentation. So we ask, you, ask for you to please use the Q&A function. That way it keeps all the questions organized and we can, we can present that to Alice as we go along. Um, this session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel later this week. You'll get an email from me when that recording is available. My colleague, Kaylin King is here and she's gonna be providing some resources in the chat as we go along. Uh, this session does run for one hour, and that includes time for conversations. So with that in mind, I'd love to turn it over to Alice. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, let's just see. Hi, everybody. All righty. So my name is Alice Antonelli, and I am a director at Nonprofit Finance Fund. I've been with the fund for, I'm in my 19th year. I actually got my start um, in lending and I have moved on to the consulting side and has, have been doing nonprofit financial consulting for, let's say, the last 15 or so years. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. So um, what we have been doing uh, at NFF, we have been acknowledging that the land we inhabit today was stolen from the indigenous community and as we are on our journey to be an anti-racist organization with a central strategy to increase our partnerships with black, indigenous and people of color led and serving organizations, we are integrating indigenous land acknowledgements as appropriate into our sessions. Today, I join you all from Philadelphia and that's the home of the Lenny Lenape people an indigenous people of the Northeastern woodlands who live in the United States and Canada. I invite you to share in the chat the indigenous territory that you are joining us from today. If you don't know the territory, you can click on the link that we are sharing in the chat and look it up. At NFF, we are seeking to include voices that have been previously excluded. We strive to bravely face the facts of this history, no matter how painful. I hope this acknowledgement continues to build and expand our understanding of our world. I believe in the sovereign rights of native communities in the Philadelphia area and also throughout the world as they continue to be powerful stewards of this earth. 
please feel free to learn more about the Native people in each of the respective territories you are joining us from today. And with that, I invite us all to do three collective breaths together to move us into today's session. I understand many of you have been joining our webinars, so I will just briefly share for those of you who are new to Nonprofit Finance Fund that we are a 40-year-old nonprofit community development financial institution, or a non-bank bank, as I like to call it. We strive to support community-centered organizations led by people of color to gain control of their financial resources and acknowledge that they need to make their community's aspirations a reality. We do this through lending to other nonprofits, consulting to nonprofit leaders, and using the insights we gain to advocate for the communities we serve and work with. So if you've been with us on this webinar journey, then you've learned about such topics as financial planning, cash flow projections, and just recently, strategic budgeting. Today, we will be discussing a different type of analysis that brings together the mission impact of our programs with their respective economics. As it states on the slide, we will be learning about how to analyze programs in terms of mission alignment and economic impact. We will introduce the mission money matrix and we are going to apply the mission money matrix using mission data and program financial information. All right, let's get started. In order to make informed decisions, we must understand how our programs contribute both to mission and financial objectives. So is there a tool or tools we can use to gain this understanding? Yes, there is. It's called the Mission Money Matrix and that can help us out. So what's behind the concept of the Mission Money Matrix? It provides a comparison of programs in terms of scale or size, mission alignment, and the contribution to the bottom line. It creates a visual representation of programmatic and financial data, which is very important, especially for those who are less versed in finance. And the tool should make the conversation accessible to a much wider audience. It also combines both mission data and financial data in one easy to read chart. So what actually is the mission money matrix in more concrete terms? Well, it's a simple two by two grid that is intended to help facilitate a discussion about the financial contribution and mission and alignment of your programs. We use it to understand how each of the organization's programs contributes to the mission and also how it contributes to the organization's bottom line. So let's take a look at what it looks like. So the per first part of this analysis involves a framework much like you see on the slide. In the framework, we have mission along the bottom and money along the vertical axis. So let's walk through this together. In the upper right-hand corner are the clear winners. They are aligned with mission and generate a net surplus. This means that the revenue that the program generates exceeds direct expenses. Some questions that we might ask can be, what can we cultivate and how can we preserve these programs? Are there opportunities for growth or replication? Let me tell you that this is pretty rare. We are nonprofits for a reason, and most of our mission-related programs really can't generate sufficient funds to cover all direct expenses. All right, let's move to the lower right-hand quadrant. This represents programs that are closely linked to mission, but that need to be financially sustained by other areas of the organization. This is far more common. 
And questions here might be, is there a potential to cut costs? Can the revenue model be changed or tweaked to generate additional revenue? Does subsidy exist somewhere else in the organization to support these programs? Now let's look at the upper left square, which shows programs that have high financial contribution, but low mission alignment. So as an example, a school for the blind that also runs a thrift store. The thrift store is not really related to mission, but it does provide a surplus that the organization can use to subsidize other programs. Questions might be in this area, is there an opportunity to align more with core programs? For instance, could we incorporate a workforce development aspect into the thrift store business? The last square on our grid shows low contribution, low mission alignment. This is an area that might require some soul searching. Most organizations do not choose to operate programs that don't relate to the mission. Some though experience mission creep where you run a couple of programs that relate somewhat to the mission for a few years, and those programs may spawn others that relate just a little bit less. So questions to ask here would be, what is the current relevance of the program to the organization? Is this a legacy program or just a one-time program? Are there opportunities for more of a strategic realignment? It's a simple two by two grid that can enable a discussion about the relative trade-offs between financial contributions and mission alignment. It's helpful to think about how the role each of our program plays in the larger context. Some programs will be valuable because of their high mission alignment. Other programs may be crucial because of their high net financial contribution to the organization. So Michael, I'd like to pause for questions here before we move on. Does anybody have any questions that you wanna put into the Q&A box? We haven't seen any questions yet. So feel free as we go along to go ahead and use that Q&A to ask as we, as we go along today. Okay, great. Well, the next uh, slide is a poll and we have a question for you if you don't have a question for us. So has your organization ever used a mission money matrix um, tool at your organization? So we've got yes, no, and maybe. And I, we're getting, we're still getting more. Hold up for, for a few more of you. There we go. All righty. So Michael, I think that's good. Um, there are the results. Whoops. Okay. So we've got, yes, 30% um, of you have used one. No, 60%. And one of you are like, well, I might have, but let's see. So that's great. Um, let's stop the sharing. And we will go on to our next question. So um, I'd like to take some time right now to chat in some answers or put them into the Q&A, whichever, you know, wherever you feel comfortable. Um, what if you were to undertake a mission money matrix? Um, let's think about these three questions. What question would you like to answer or questions? Is the data available? And how do you see the analysis being useful? So chat in your answers to this. And as you're doing that, um, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about, um, we're gonna run through a case study today. Um, and as an example, I'll tell you what we, how, how we answer these questions with the executive director. Our case study is the, is, ABC Arts Community Arts Center. And when we first started working with them, we asked these three key questions. The answer to the first question was that the ED had been struggling with the closures relating to COVID-19. She wanted to re-examine all of her programs, not only to look at the profitability of them, 
but also to re-examine the mission fit going forward in light of reopening under the post-COVID environment. So to understand the dynamics of what was impacting their profitability or lack thereof, we suggested that she could conduct a mission money matrix in order to map the current and future programming, specifically looking at the mission fit and also the economics of current and future programs. So the answer to number two, she believed that she had the data for most of her programs, but that's a big question, especially in light of new or completely revamped programming. So this could be, take a little bit of work. Um, and the last question, she did see this analysis being useful. Um, and we're going to kind of talk through that a little bit today. Um, Michael, I don't know if anybody responded in the chat and if uh, you wanted to highlight um, some of what people were saying. If anybody well, responded. Alice yeah, I can give you a question. So someone says, can you give an example of something that's low impact and low mission? Low, so low financial impact and low mission. Um, let's see. Let's see. Um, <laughs> okay, so an easy example is going back to the School of the Blind. Um, where they were running a, a nonprofit, or sorry, they were running a thrift store. If that thrift store is not bringing in any money, then I would say that activity is really, it's not mission aligned and it's also not generating profitability, right? Um, sometimes too, like uh, organizations um, like to do big gala events um, or, or special events, and a lot of times those events um, are you know, neutral on the bottom line. Sometimes they actually uh, cost more money than they are generating in terms of um, sources. And I think in terms of the mission fit, yeah, sometimes people use them to kind of amplify their missions and get, them, and get the word out there, but it's probably not a direct program of the organization. I will say there is an exception to that, and uh, in Philadelphia, we had the Arts and Business Council and their main program actually was the gala. So it was actually a direct fit with their, um, with their mission. So everybody's different, um, but let's, we're gonna continue and I'm gonna show you how you can actually gain some of, um, kind of more of the insight on, on mission fit and also on financial fit. Um, if I did not answer your question, feel free to uh, type it in in a different way and, and we'll get to it later. Thanks, Michael. Alrighty, so let's take a look at the mission part of the equation. How do we get started? Alrighty, so first we want to build out the program architecture. We will want to separate the programs from capacity and we define capacity as administration, development, facility, or tech. So, as I said, we're going to use the ABC Community Arts Program. And these are their core areas. Um, and I'm actually going to tell you a little bit about each program area, just to kind of fill in the context, if you will. So the first one is art education for youth. And the art education program provides both in school and after school and on site arts based programming for youth. Art education for adults, this program provides arts based programming for adults through on site evening and weekend classes. Next is community murals. This is ABC's oldest program. Beautiful murals transformed public spaces are the final products of year-round workshops, community meetings, health forums, and paint days. And lastly, art in the prison. It's an alternative to traditional means of rehabilitation, focusing on conversation and understanding and art as the first steps on the path to healing. So notice on the capacity or the non-program side, we separated out development activities, and administration. Alrighty, so 
Next, we're going to send out a survey to ask questions about different aspects of each program. So first, let's figure out who are we going to survey. Stakeholders can and have included staff, board, organizational partners or collaborators, advisors, and even program participants. The survey should go to a representative sample and the sample size should at least be greater than three. Keep in mind, anyone who is surveyed may be interested in the results of the survey, so this list may be informed by who is in the room during any presentation. Remember, anyone you ask to take the survey is going to want to know why, so it's important to give the context. So for example, you may want to use this tool for strategic planning purposes, decision-making, or as a part of an organizational assessment. Alrighty, so now we need to develop the survey. To understand how programs relate to mission, we use a survey to learn about mission impact or alignment of each of the programs. We're not just talking about impact as it relates to the program outcomes. We're actually using that word in a much broader context. So notice the form or the spreadsheet down at the bottom of the slide. This is given to each staff or board member and others that you may have identified, and they will rate the programs based on each of the questions asked. The questionnaire can also be com completed on Zoomerang, Fluid Survey, Survey Monkey, Monkey, sorry, and Google Forms, or even through an email. So in this slide, we have some sample questions. The first at the top is alignment with core mission. Ask your group to rate how well the programs address and achieve the core mission. Number two, implementation of the programs. Ask them to rate how well the organization implements each program. And they can actually reflect on some program evaluation data or even constituent feedback. So number three, does the program currently reach the maximum number of participants? Ask the respondents to consider the number of people or the communities impacted by the program as it currently exists. For example, if the program worked with 30 youth, it would be scored higher than a program that worked with only five. Just because someone might rate the program as a one does not mean that we are relieving ourselves of that program. This is about gathering information and not decision making at the moment though we are hoping that it will help with facilitating some maybe difficult conversations. On this slide, we have more questions. So at the top, we've got cultivation. To what extent does the activity lead participants to other programs within the organization and thus increase the overall impact of the organization? Number five, does the program provide a service that is not readily available or affordable elsewhere in the community? Number six, how important is the program to contributors? To what extent does the particular activity motivate funders and donors to contribute resources to the organization? So you can customize with questions that are relevant to your organization and your situation. You don't have to use these. And we, overall, we're going to average the ratings for the questions, and that's going to give us one of the two data points that we need to visualize the mission money impact of each of the programs. Alrighty. So next, we have an example of one person's rating using the one to five scoring. Notice that the raw ratings are above and the weighted averages are below. Note the weightings in the middle. You can weight which response you would like to have more of an impact on the scoring. And you can do this by yourself or maybe collectively with a group. Let's look at the total weighted average at the right. Looks like for this one particular person, art in prison ranks the highest with a five, then art for art education for youth, 4.1, and so on with art education for adults ranking the lowest at 3.1. So before we move on, Michael, um, let me know if there are any questions that have come in or if anybody has a question, please ask it. 
We don't have any questions yet, but I'd also share that we're going to share a copy of this tool for everybody. Um, so you'll be able to get a download of this. All righty, let's keep going. All right, now let's explore the money part. All right. So financial methodology. First, we typically start with an annual budget forecast or other forward looking projection. Then we identify and assign all revenue and expenses that are directly tied to each program and all supporting expenses like management, occupancy, fundraising, IT, those are examined separately. By doing this type of analysis, we can see which programs generate surpluses and deficits, thereby understanding the direct effect the program has on the organization's bottom line. So we've seen this slide before, and now what we're going to do is input these program areas into the spreadsheet. So here we go. So this is nonprofit finance funds program economic analysis worksheet. That's a mouthful. We put the program areas up at the top and the numbers go in the middle. Revenue is gonna be at the top here and then expenses are gonna follow underneath. And as Michael said, we're gonna make this template available to participants after the webinar. So you'll be able to fill it in yourself. Alrighty, so we do have an example and that's our community arts uh, organization. So it, this slide shows the tool after the executive director entered in all of her numbers. So let's continue with the architecture. On the top of the spreadsheet, you can see all of her programs, art education for youth, for adults, community murals, art in prison, and also know that, note that there's a space for new programming that she might wanna consider at a later time. The revenue and expenses here are direct activities associated with program areas. If a program were to go away, the associated revenue and expense would go away as well. So for example, if you have a major funder that is discontinuing funding, let's say in the art and prison program, and you decide that you could no longer continue this program, the salaries and other direct expenses would no longer be able to get paid. So on the right, we have capacity. Now you might like to think of this as administration, um, tech, here, as you can see, we have um, labeled them development, admin, and special events. So the revenue and expenses here in capacity are the indirect activities associated with what it takes just to open the doors, turn on the lights before you produce one unit of service or programming. You can also think of it as the revenue and expenses that will not leave your organization if programs change, grow, or are discontinued. So for example, the executive director's salary, even if the executive director wears many programmatic hats, will not go away if one of the programs alters or goes away. So let's walk through uh, the art education for youth column here. At the top, we have revenue in the form of a specific contract with the school district for this program. Next are class fees for on-site programming, institutional support from funders and corporations, and net assets released from restrictions. Note that all of these revenue sources are specific to the art education for youth and not any other program, nor do they represent general operating support. Next, we have expenses in the form of personnel. This could reflect a program director and possibly six to seven full-time teachers. Then we have administration and program expenses. This could be art supplies and other expenses that directly relate to this program. Consulting and professional fees. This might reflect contractor swing labor. Mural expenses, notice that there are none for this program. We've got special events. This special event expense is specifically for the art education for youth program. 
And then we have building and occupancy. This could represent payment to a private school for use of their space. The numbers that we will specifically need to complete our analysis are located here at the bottom, the surplus and deficit for each of the programs. We will also take the size of the budget, which is located here at total expenses. So before we move on, I'd like to pause for some questions. Michael, do we have any questions specifically related to how to fill out this form? No questions yet. Okay. So let's move on. Now we're going to pull it all together. So as a reminder, we have mission along the bottom axis and money along the vertical axis. Programs with strong mission alignment would sit over on the right and those with lower mission alignment would be closer to the left. Similarly, along the vertical axis, programs that generate the largest margins or surpluses are towards the top, whereas programs that run deficits or require subsidy are on the bottom. Lastly, note that the size of the circle represents the budget size of each program. All righty. So this is the output from our friends at ABC Community Center, Community Arts Center. When you combine the two parts of the analysis, the numbers from the program economic spreadsheet and the mission impact survey to inform mission piece, you can create a graph that looks like this. Notice the four quadrants with mission on the horizontal axis and margin and profitability on the vertical axis. Remember the size of the circle is the size of the budget of each of the programs. So the bigger the circle, the bigger the budget size. As you move up and down the chart, you can get a sense of profitability. And as you go from left to right is the mission alignment. So I'd like to take just a few moments to sit with this picture and come up with a few observations and please feel free to chat them in. So I'm gonna go on silent mode, if you will. And what do you see here? What are, what are the takeaways? And Michael, perhaps as they um, start chatting them in, you could just read them out, out loud. Alrighty, <laughs> um, I'm guessing nobody's typing in. Um, so I'm happy to give my own observations, um, but please feel free to ask questions. Um, so my first observation is um, some, but not all of the programs have positive mission alignment according to the surveys. And second, one of the programs is a break-even program and the other three are deficit producing. So how about this? Let's do a little quiz. Which one of the programs is break-even? And just type in your answer. And I cannot see the chat, so... Um, Michael, let me know if uh, what people are typing in. So we're looking for the break even program. And you can see the programs on the on the left uh, on the legend. We've got art ed youth, art ed adults, community mural and art in prison. I think we've we uh, we're hearing the mural as break even. Great. Okay. Excellent. Now here's another question: Which is the um, or, or the program with the smallest budget? 
And if, just type in your answers. And we've got yellow for art ed youth, orange for art ed adults, pink for community mural, and blue for art in prison. So we're looking for the, the, or, uh, the program with the smallest budget. And remember the size of the circle represents the size of the budget. So we're not looking at how actually how big the budget is, but just relative, which is, which is the program that is the smallest in terms of budget size. And we'd say that it's the art education youth. Ah, uh, okay. So let me say that this is art education youth. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's the big yellow um, uh, circle. And the larger the circle, the larger the budget size. So actually art education youth is the one with the largest. Um, and I think I said I was looking for the smallest and the smallest budget size is over here the art education adults, the small orange circle. So that's the smallest budget. All right. So there's some in interesting conversations that you could have based on all the information presented here, even without a detailed understanding of the organization. So for instance, we did say that the community mural program is a break even, it's right here smack in the middle of um, not only the margin which goes up and down, but also smack in the middle of um, uh, the program mission alignment. Um, but it is the highest profitable or the most profitable program uh, of the four. And so one of the questions that I would have is, is there a way to improve the economics of the community mural program since it's so close to generating positive economics? Um, so we might look at how to improve the revenue um, with community mural, or we might look to see how we could trim expenses. Um, you know, maybe there is some sort of programmatic event that we could do that could generate um, you know, more revenue than it actually costs to produce. Um, so those are some of the questions or the observations and hopefully you can see how this might spark um, conversation among uh, the constituents who put together um, or who participated in your survey. Um, another um, observation is uh, way over here, this small, arts education for adults program. So it's not only the smallest program in terms of budget size, but it also produces a deficit. So it's in the lower quadrant um, or the lower half of the screen, if you will. Um, but it also seems that many who filled out the survey don't believe that it's really mission aligned. So it's way over on the left and you can see it's kind of near that word that says weak, weak mission alignment. So one question, and I don't think we have to be shy about asking it is, well, what if we discontinued the program? Um, I think before we do, we wanna ask more questions of the people surveyed, why, you know, why did they think, you know, it was less mission aligned um, and maybe get into the details of some of the questions. Um, so really kind of rolling up our sleeves and asking, you know, questions and facilitating discussion. But if we did um, let this program go, um, it might free up other resources or time for the executive director to pursue more, strate more strategic opportunities. But I think what we want to do is ask further questions. You know, how can this program be improved and, and what would that look like either on a mission side or also on the uh, financial side? So using this visualization of your organization's budget can help spark deeper conversation about where there are areas for improvement or change. And that's, that's what I hope. Um, 
just note that this graph is an aggregate look at all the survey answers from all the participants weighted accordingly. Um, but you could break this down literally by program and really get into you know, a, a matrix like this per program, or you could do it per question or both. Um, so before I move on, Michael, any questions relating to this chart? I don't see any, I think we're good. Okay, great. Um, so what I'd like to do is actually overlay this chart. This is the graphic that we saw in the beginning. Um, this was our framework. Um, but let's see how it looks with the bubbles or the circles overlaid. And there we go. Okay. So now, you know, it's overlaid on top of, um, you know, the nice fancy chart that we've been using the whole entire time. Um, and hopefully now, you know, it's easier to see, you know, just anything up here is high contribution, high mission, the upper right hand quadrant. And then way down below is low contribution, low mission alignment, which I think was that question earlier on, um, you know, the arts, uh, arts education for adults uh, doesn't necessarily align with um, uh, the mission as much. That's what people are saying. And also uh, it has a deficit. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of squarely in that lower left-hand quadrant. Alrighty, so there's an opportunity, hopefully, for you guys to focus on what you do well and to structure yourself to support those activities. Doing more with less is not sustainable, particularly in this economic environment. We as leaders need to give ourselves permission to do less with less. As you are asking yourself some tough questions and beginning to identify options, it's important to keep in mind what is core or non-negotiable when you consider both the present and the future. And I like at the bottom the, um, uh, the three bullet points, what we must do, should do, and want to do, MSW. So what must we do, right? This is gonna be really mission aligned. What should we do? This is probably gonna be a little bit more financially aligned. And what do we want to do? What are the opportunities that we have that we're excited about? Um, you know, maybe new programming or a new activity. But in an ideal world, any priority activity really does need to be net positive in terms of the finances. But if they're not, that just means that they need to be supported by something else in your in your budget. You know, so maybe you get a lot of general operating support, or maybe you've got that um, uh, uh, program that is not necessarily mission aligned, but it really does generate a lot of uh, net operating surpluses. So some organizations and leaders may wanna ask themselves, what will we look like a year from now as a changed and potent potentially smaller organization? The key to answering this question is to identify what is core to our mission and determining whether we can support it either alone or maybe in partnership with others. We can apply this information to decisions about which programs to grow, to trim, or eliminate in the context of financial, mission, and other organizational considerations. This information can inform you how to prioritize your programs are there any clear winners or clear distractions? But also to narrow in on activities that deserve more of management's attention on both the revenue and cost side and also in the context of mission. All right, so reflection time. So how can the mission money matrix help you going forward, specifically with what your situation is right now. Um, highlighting the program metrics in a way that allows you to have transparent conversations about your programs with a variety of different people. Um, you know, we mentioned board, we mentioned staff, um, 
we mentioned the program participants, um, maybe we can use this information to have a conversation with our, you know, with our state arts council or with the county um, arts council. So what do you guys think? If you could um, chat in your responses or put them into the Q&A either way, um, what do you think about this tool? And do you think it might be helpful? And Michael, you know, as people are writing in and as you're seeing some of the answers, um, I'd love to I'd love to hear. Yeah, Alice, this is one that I've been getting quite a bit actually, and it has to do with reopening from from uh, closures because of COVID, and and folks knowing that they have through maybe uh, saving some expenses over the past year and getting a lot of PPP funding and a lot of grant funding, and their balance sheets may actually be all you know intense purposes like actually some cash in there so as they start to reboot the organization deciding which programs need to come online first uh uh having a, a, a hard time trying to understand what is critical to mission knowing that there may be some uh, some funding that's that's backing that up yeah so um that's a good observation and i know there's a question in there as well so, um, and I'm seeing this as well, especially with arts organizations, you know, the buildup of cash and um, whether it is from cutting expenses or um, uh, the program, ooh, uh, the paycheck protection program loans that are, uh, that folks um, have been receiving. Um, and that gives folks, I do think a really good opportunity to, you know, take some time um, and really think about things. But in terms of like which open um, programs to open up, uh, what is the priority? Um, you know, it may not be uh, a bad idea to put kind of one of these min mission money matrices together um, to ask that specific question. You know, how, you know, how do we want to move forward? Which program do my constituents, whether staff or board or program participants, feel like uh, they want to see, um, you know, advance out of the gate, given, you know, perhaps popularity, um, given safety concerns, you know, all of that. Um, I think if you do do a survey like this, um, and this probably goes without being, you know, without being said, but um a lot of people are uh taking a lot of surveys um nowadays um just to you know give be able to give feedback to um to whoever you know there are tons of surveys out there so be very um careful about survey fatigue and if you're asking that one question i'd actually ask a number of them um you know you could ask four questions maybe six maybe eight uh, I think you have to be careful on the number of questions as well, but maybe put together a small committee to really think about um, at this juncture, if we're thinking about reopening, perhaps in September, we've got some time, what other questions do we have? Um, what do we want to hear from folks um, and get that, that mission side of, um, uh, of the matrix, uh, get that data coming in? And then likewise, you know, let's do a little bit of um, a profitability exercise, right? Um, you could do, I think my suggestion is actually look forward thinking on the, on the financial side of what it could look like, your best guess, um, and put those numbers in and populate the spreadsheet um to come up with your best guess on on profitability because that's going to be important as well you know we'll be able to use some historical information um but again maybe put together a small committee so that you can really think about um what it is going to be like you know moving forward and then lastly i'll say is new programming you know this does give us the opportunity We've all kind of pivoted and we, a lot of us have switched to virtual. Um, you know, what does that look like in the future? You know, do we want to continue with it? So um, I think the, you know, the time is now to really kind of 
uh, take some time to think about the future. And this is just one tool that we could use that really kind of does a nice job of coupling the financial side with the mission side. Uh, Michael, I, I hope that does answer the question. Um, perhaps it raises more questions. I'm happy to answer them as they come in. Yeah, I think you mentioned the one about the uh, the economics of programs. They may have shifted from pre-COVID, uh, definitely with increased um, expenses as you as you bring in the public in. We're still sanitizing and still have some additional expenses that are attributable to that. Uh, but I think your point of relying on historical data, but also kind of looking at the economics as it is now to make sure that the numbers you're looking at are actually true and accurate. Yep, perfect. Any other comments that you're receiving or questions that are coming in? I think that's it. Okay. Um, so let's advance our slide. We are coming to the end. Um, so I hope that we have achieved our goals today. Um, the first one is learning to analyze programs in terms of both mission alignment and um, financial impact. Uh, we've introduced to you this mission money matrix, if you will. And um, during the course of our time together, we applied the mission money matrix by using mission data through a survey and also program financial information, which um, you can come up with um, on your own or with a small group of folks um, uh, at your organization. Um, so I'd love for you to chat in uh head heart and feet so what did you learn from today's session was there anything that you learned and if you did please chat it in um how did today's session make you feel um are you still anxious about the future does this give you pause um is this exciting like i've got a new tool i can use um and then feet what actions are you going to bring back to your organization um, is there anything in particular that you want to state um, uh, that you're going to bring back? So if you guys could chat that in either to the chat or the Q&A, that would be great um, just to get your feedback. And Michael, you know, as they come in, just let me let me know. And I think, Alice, as we're waiting for folks to kind of think about this, um, we know that we have another session coming up next week in our series. Um, could you preview that for us? Yeah, as we look absolutely. Ahead? So up next, we will be learning about managing risk and opportunities. Um, I have to say, this is one of my favorite subjects. Um, it's going to be taught by Mr. Johnny Lambour, and I hope you can join us. It's going to be June 1st um 1 to 2 p.m eastern standard time and uh in this session we're going to introduce the concept of full cost i don't know if we've talked about it previously but um nff is uh or nonprofit finance fund um we really do like this uh um concept of full cost so i'm gonna leave it there as a little teaser um, but i do hope you uh come to this next webinar Great. And for those of you here, I've just put into the chat the link for that. So if you wanted to go ahead and take an advantage to register for that same bat channel, same bat time for those of you who know what that is, uh, one o'clock next Tuesday, uh, we'll be doing it again. Uh, someone did write in. So uh, head thinking about the perception of success versus actual success mm -hmm. and heart feeling still some over overwhelming feelings, but grateful for tools. Great. Well, I really appreciate um, the feedback and I don't know if um, I just continue to type in. I do see that we have um, five minutes left and I'm more than happy to stay on um, the channel, if you will, uh, for any questions that I can help uh, answer. But in the meantime, if people do want to leave, you can get five minutes back. I do want to take some time out to thank all of you for joining today, or if you're listening to this recording, thank you so much. Um, and also thanks to the Massachusetts Cultural Council for making this and all of the other webinars available. So as Michael said, you're gonna receive an email uh, that's going to include a PDF of today's presentation in addition to the Excel file 
for the program profitability piece of um, uh, of our tool to, today to help you get started on the financial analysis piece of today's webinar. So that's it for today. And uh, thank you all. And I really do wish you the best of luck. So I'm ready and willing to stay on for any questions. Um, Michael, just feel free to let me know if there are some. Otherwise, you guys enjoy your day. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Alice, for providing this uh, next step for us in our webinar. I don't see any questions yet, but um, I just wanted to highlight for the folks that are here that uh, Kaylin has put a link in our chat about the session we're doing on Thursday, and it's about virtual fundraising. Uh, I should actually say digital fundraising because all fundraising is actual real work, not virtual. But uh, yeah. knowing that you had to do a lot of virtual galas and a lot of online online fundraising, we know that's probably going to continue in the in the years ahead. So Sarah Stackhouse, some of you may know Sarah. Sarah is running that session for us. So if you uh, would like to get some best practices about online fundraising and online galas, uh, sign up for that one, and we'll see you then. Alice, in the meantime, thank you so much for all of your expertise and your help and everybody else. Thanks for joining us today. And we'll see you at the next Mass Cultural Council webinar. Thank all you right. so much. Thank you. Bye.